Los Angeles, California is earthquake country. This huge sprawling metropolitan area is located in a region of the United States where earthquakes are common. The people here live with the knowledge that any day an earthquake could paralyze their city. Downtown Los Angeles is a complex of towering high-rise buildings of steel and glass. What if an earthquake sent them and the people in them tumbling down? The Los Angeles metropolitan area is the home of more than nine million people, one of the largest concentrations of humans on Earth. Los Angeles is a city on the move, its streets teeming with people and vehicles. What if a major earthquake tore apart these streets on a busy weekday at rush hour? One of the vital lifelines of Los Angeles is a tangled, complex web of expressways which carry millions of vehicles daily. Suppose an earthquake devastated this vital transportation network, bringing overpasses and bridges crashing down in a matter of seconds. Because it is a center of commerce and culture, Los Angeles attracts large numbers of people for holidays, business, or just to live there. Los Angeles continues to grow, as does the rest of California. By the end of the century, earthquake country could be the home of nearly one-fifth of the United States population. How many of these people would be killed or maimed if a powerful earthquake struck today? On February the 9th, 1971, the San Fernando Valley near Los Angeles was rocked by a destructive earthquake which lasted some 60 seconds. The quake hit early in the morning, fortunately before rush hour, because many bridges and freeways were quickly destroyed. Property destruction was estimated at $500 million. 64 people lost their lives and more than a thousand were injured. This earthquake took place along the San Fernando Fault, part of the San Andreas Fault System, which stretches some 1,440 kilometers along the west coast of North America, from Mexico to San Francisco, where it plunges beneath the Pacific Ocean. San Francisco is also a densely populated city in earthquake country. In 1906, it was devastated by a major earthquake and fire. From the ashes and rubble, a new city rose, which has grown to be one of the outstanding cities of the world, famed for its vitality, climate, architecture, and cultural contributions. But the people here live with the possibility that another death-dealing quake could strike at any time. Recording, studying, explaining, and trying to learn how to predict earthquakes is the work of seismology, one of the Earth's sciences. An earthquake is a violent vibration of the Earth generated by the sudden release of pent-up energy from strained crustal rocks. Tectonic earthquakes are the most common. They occur when rocks break suddenly in response to geological forces. The San Fernando Valley earthquake and other earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault System are tectonic in origin. Earthquakes may also be associated with volcanic eruptions caused by the upward movement of molten rock from beneath the volcano. Often there will be a series of small earth tremors which may give warning of an impending eruption. Earthquakes are caused by powerful geological forces rarely visible on the surface. For example, the rocks on either side of a fault may move only a few centimeters per year but this movement produces enormous stress and strain in the rocks. As movement continues over years or even centuries, stress and strain increase. More and more elastic energy is stored in the rocks. Along the San Andreas Fault, displacement of channels is visible proof that horizontal movement has taken place. By means of a diagram, we can represent the horizontal movement. A cutaway view reveals that the underlying rocks have been displaced. We can also see the focus of an earthquake, the place beneath the surface where the rocks have been ruptured. The location on the surface directly above the focus is called the epicenter of the earthquake. Maximum damage is most likely to occur at the epicenter. Earthquakes generate two main types of seismic or shock waves, body waves and surface waves. Body waves travel through the interior of the Earth. The fastest of these are primary or P waves. 
These compressional waves move faster in dense rock and slower in fluids. Thus, their speed and direction change. Because they are deflected by the Earth's core, P waves are not seen in the so-called shadow zone. The slowest body waves are secondary or S waves. S waves are elastic shear waves that move material sideways at right angles to their direction of travel. Because secondary waves travel only through solids, they do not penetrate the Earth's outer molten core. For this reason, there is also an S-wave shadow zone. The slower seismic surface waves do not penetrate the Earth's interior, but follow the surface. One type of surface wave, the love wave, travels in a circular motion and causes damage by displacing materials horizontally. Love waves can be very damaging. This cracked pavement and these twisted railway tracks clearly demonstrate their destructive power. Earthquake damage also results from Rayleigh waves, surface waves which deform materials vertically. Earthquake damage along sea coasts may be caused by seismic sea waves, such as those generated by the 1964 quake in Alaska. These giant waves are caused by earthquakes which take place beneath the ocean floor. Seismic sea waves are commonly called tsunamis, the Japanese name. They can be incredibly destructive. The tsunami which smashed the Alaskan coast in 1964 ripped up railway lines and highways and tossed freight cars and locomotives around like toys. Seismologists, scientists who study earthquakes, use a variety of techniques and instruments to learn about these powerful and destructive geological events. Most important is the seismograph, which is based on a simple principle, that of the pendulum. A metal mass is freely suspended from a framework set in the earth. A rotating drum and stylus act as a recording device. Earthquake waves vibrate the entire structure but the pendulum's inertia causes its movements to lag behind the framework's movements. The differences in relative motion are recorded on the rotating drum. Modern seismographs are complex and sensitive. Seismic tremors may generate a tiny electrical signal which drives a stylus, and the data can be recorded on magnetic tape for future use. The record produced is called a seismogram. This is a seismogram of the 1970 San Fernando earthquake. Seismologists can learn a great deal from the jagged tracings on a seismogram. These records of seismic vibrations can reveal the location and strength of the earthquake which produced them. P waves are the first to be detected by the seismograph. These are immediately followed by the arrival of the first S waves. Using the arrival times of these waves, Travel time charts yield some basic information about an earthquake. Its distance in degrees, the difference in arrival time between P and S waves, and the distance to the epicenter in kilometers. The next step is to find the location of the earthquake's epicenter. Seismologists must use distance measurements from at least three different seismograph stations, and then plot the location by trigonometry. On a map, three arcs of a circle are drawn at the proper distances from three stations. The epicenter is located approximately where the three arcs intersect. The seismologist can now determine the magnitude or size of the earthquake. Wave motion and duration are recorded and measured. This measurement is entered into a computer along with other data from the travel time chart. Computers enable seismologists to process vast amounts of data thus determining earthquake magnitudes with great precision. Magnitudes are expressed in Arabic numerals on a scale devised by the geologist Charles Richter. 6.51 indicates a moderate to severe quake. The San Fernando quake in 1971 measured 6.51 on the Richter scale. Measurements on the Richter scale are based on wave amplitude and degree of ground motion. The Richter scale is open-ended. It is also logarithmic, which means an increase of one magnitude corresponds to a tenfold increase in wave amplitude. The Richter scale also provides an estimate of energy in an earthquake. For each increase of one in magnitude, 
there is about a 30-fold increase in the amount of energy released. Another scale measures the intensity or the effects of an earthquake on a particular place. The modified Mercalli intensity scale is a subjective evaluation based on observation by people. At level 8, for example, walls, chimneys and columns tumble and there is considerable damage to ordinary buildings with partial collapse. At intensity 9, well-designed frame structures are damaged and partial collapse takes place. Buildings are shifted off the foundations. At level 10, wide cracks appear in pavements. Underground pipes rupture and leak. Pavements break and buckle. Most masonry and frame structures are heavily damaged or destroyed along with their foundations. At intensity 11, dams are ruptured and bridge pillars can be so badly damaged that they may collapse. Intensities on the modified Mercalli scale are expressed in Roman numerals, beginning at intensity 1 and continuing to level 12, which is total destruction. Data on the intensities, magnitudes and locations of earthquakes are gathered at the National Earthquake Information Service in Golden, Colorado. Here, staff seismologists and geologists of the United States Geological Survey process earthquake information received on a regular basis from 650 seismological stations around the world. The data collected at Golden are a vital store of information for scientists trying to learn more about the causes and effects of earthquakes. A map at Golden shows the epicenters of significant earthquakes in the United States during the year. Note that earthquakes are not evenly distributed in the United States or around the world. By far the largest number of quakes take place along clearly defined belts. Many of these seismic belts are found along the margins of large ocean basins and continents in many places around the Earth. Volcanic activity is also frequent along these belts. Many quakes occur beneath the ocean floor near the huge undersea mountain ranges known to geologists as mid-oceanic ridges. Why are earthquakes concentrated in these places? They are regions of crustal unrest and geological change, places where volcanoes erupt, mountains and islands are built and destroyed, and the Earth's crust is in upheaval. Geologists believe these regions correspond to the borders of moving plates. According to this theory, the Earth's outer crust consists of giant plates riding on top of a layer of weaker rock. The Pacific and North American plates grind against each other, both moving in a generally northwesterly direction at different rates. South of San Francisco, evidence of the San Andreas Fault System is seen as a series of lakes where the margins of the Pacific and North American plates meet. The movement of these two plates against each other is very small, only a few centimeters per year. At a U.S. Geological Survey laboratory in Menlo Park, California, experiments are underway to learn more about the behavior of the Earth's crustal rocks. Two massive blocks of granite are placed against each other and wired with instruments that measure stress and strain. Seismographs are used to measure wave vibrations. Where the blocks meet, there is a crack, just as there may be a fault where certain crustal plates meet. In this experiment, the granite slabs are moved against each other very slightly, generating vibrations that are recorded for study. Thus, laboratory models are helping geologists learn more about conditions along the San Andreas fault system. This knowledge may someday help save lives and property. Other experiments are conducted in the field. This U.S. Geological Survey team is working near Palmdale, north of Los Angeles, where a section of the San Andreas Fault System has been locked in place for more than a hundred years. Seismologists are concerned by this, so a project is underway to measure the amount of stress on the rocks. A borehole is drilled more than 200 meters deep. And then fluid is pumped into a small, isolated section of the borehole. As more and more fluid is injected, the pressure in that section increases. Measurements of the pressure changes are recorded. Eventually, enough fluid is pumped into the borehole section to fracture its walls. 
The resulting stress measurements can provide important data about the behavior of rocks along the San Andreas Fault system. This data may help seismologists to develop techniques for predicting earthquakes. The San Andreas is the most intensively studied fault system on Earth. Field research takes place at many locations. Lasers are especially useful in earthquake research. A laser is a concentrated beam of light which provides highly accurate distance measurements. In the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, southeast of Palmdale, the US Geological Survey is setting up a laser ranging station. Targets are placed at strategic locations along both sides of the San Andreas Fault. The installation here will monitor extremely small movements along the fault by the technique of laser ranging. Lasers are installed on one side of the fault and a target on the opposite side. The laser beam is aimed at the target and its distance is determined. Suppose there is movement along the fault. The laser is used to find the new target distance and the amount of movement is calculated by trigonometry. Other targets on both sides of the fault are used to refine and verify the measurements. Laser ranging over many kilometers can accurately detect movement of only a few centimeters. These measurements might later provide valuable data useful in predicting an earthquake. The Palmdale area is the site of another experiment by geologists, concerned about the fact that the fault zone here has been locked for many years. A team of seismologists from the California Institute of Technology is setting up seismograph stations in the vicinity of the so-called Palmdale Bulge. This is an area where the Earth's crust has been forced upwards because there is no horizontal movement along this tightly locked section of the fault. The purpose of this study is to learn why this part of the San Andreas Fault has been quiet for so long. Here there may be clues to the future behavior of the fault. At several locations, seismologists install highly sensitive seismographs. The instruments are partially buried and covered to reduce unwanted surface noise. Readings will be taken at regular intervals for many months. If seismic activity should start taking place, the scientists hope to detect changes which could allow them to determine whether or not an earthquake might occur. Although earthquake prediction is still in its infancy, research such as this may someday make prediction possible. Earthquake studies also center on structures built by humans and the effects that earthquakes might have on them. In a laboratory at the University of California at Berkeley, Researchers work with models to determine the effects of stress and strain on different kinds of structures. For example, how much stress will a particular bridge design tolerate before it collapses? Experiments of this kind lead to guidelines for construction which can make buildings more earthquake resistant. The Transamerica building in San Francisco is a striking example of a structure designed to resist severe earthquakes, to save people's lives. At the Berkeley Laboratory, materials used in construction are vibrated on a shake table. Engineers can learn which materials handle the greatest stress, and equally important, how they should be assembled to resist earthquake damage. Suppose an earthquake the same strength as the 1906 San Francisco earthquake were to strike the cities of California today. The death and destruction could be severe, because these cities have become so densely populated and built up. Geologists and engineers have predicted that tens of thousands of people could lose their lives and property destruction could run into billions of dollars. Transport systems could be paralyzed and the lifelines of water, gas, electricity and telephone services would be badly disrupted. The goal of earthquake research is to learn more about these powerful and frightening geological events in order to minimize the damage they do in order to save the lives and property of the people of earthquake country.